welcome to uh, this third session of Spark's Open Access 101 series. I'm uh, Nick Shockey. I'm the Director of Programs and Engagement at Spark and am thrilled to kick off today's session. We are organizing uh, this whole series to provide uh, an entry point to open access work in libraries as well as a refresher for those who are already doing this work. And we hope that the session so far uh, have, have been helpful. And we are interested in how we can continue to build on these to provide a more robust support structure for those you know, who are involved in doing this work uh, on campus. And as part of that, we are very interested to get your feedback both on today's session, as well as on this series overall. Uh, so we'd ask that you take a brief moment after today's session to respond to the short survey that'll pop up at the close of the event uh, that will cover not only this uh, this event, but also has a, a question about overall feedback for this Open Access 101 series so far. And because of the interest in the first three events, we are excited to announce today that we will be organizing a fourth event in the Open Access 101 series with this one being focused on answering questions that faculty most frequently ask. Uh, this next 90 minute session will take place in a few weeks uh, on Monday, September 30th from three to 4.30 Eastern. And with OA week coming up at the end of October, our hope is that the next session uh, focused on commonly asked faculty questions uh, can provide timely support to folks as you prepare for the week and uh, the common questions uh, that come along with it from faculty. So as we start today's session on emerging issues and open access, uh, I uh, invite folks to again introduce yourself in the chat very briefly uh, by sharing your name and institution and um, in line with today's discussion, feel free to mention any particular emerging issue area um, that you are particularly interested in discussing today. It's been really interesting to see, you know, sort of the breadth of folks that have been participating in these sessions from, um, you know, different regions as well as from all different types of institutions. Uh, we, similar to the last couple, because of the interest in these sessions, uh, we plan to keep uh, today's event open past the top of the hour for an extended Q&A if we don't get to all the questions uh, in the 60 minutes that we have allotted. Uh, however, please you know, don't feel obligated to stay um, at all. We will, like the other sessions, provide a link uh, to a recording to everybody who's registered um, once it's available. So if you need to run at the top of the hour, if you're not, uh, you will have the chance to catch up on uh, the sort of overtime if we do do run long up to, to 90 minutes if folks want to stick around that long. Uh, we'd also enthusiastically encourage folks to share your own experiences and, thought, uh, and thoughts in the chat throughout today's session. Uh, as enthusiastically as everybody's introducing themselves now. Uh, but for questions specifically, we'd ask that you use the Q&A functionality uh, on Zoom, which will help to facilitate uh, the discussion with so many participants. Uh, it's helpful to have those there so we can sort of keep track of them. And uh, you can also upvote and respond to questions that have been submitted um, you know, that can help you know, respond to them in real time, uh, as well as sort of surface the questions that are of most interest uh, to folks. And then lastly, I just want to mention again how thrilled we are to be collaborating um, with Maria Bond, Will Cross, uh, and Josh Bullock in organizing uh, this series. Uh, for anybody that hasn't attended an earlier session, I just want to again highlight uh, their fantastic recently published book, Scholarly Communication, Librarianship, and Open Knowledge, which I will uh, drop a link to in the chat. Uh, that really is a rich source of case studies about open related work in libraries uh, that's written by folks you know, across uh, all different types of institutions directly involved in doing uh, this important work locally. And they're very complimentary work uh, in the scholarly communications notebook is another really rich uh, resource, uh, ever evolving resource uh, for folks uh, interested in getting involved in open related work uh, on campus. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Maria uh, Bond, who will lead us through today's uh, discussion. Maria. Thank you, Nick. And welcome, everybody. It's, it's exciting to see you here. Uh, I will introduce the three of us in a minute, but I'll mention it was a heavy prep day for me because despite two decades almost in the classroom, I prepare until the last minute and I was going to be talking to you all. And... Um, Tomorrow morning for three hours, I'm in um, my classroom, which uh, 
Gosh, some of you may have taken this class because it's been one of our required classes at UIUC forever uh, on libraries, information, and society. And uh, tomorrow, the topic is uh, community. And I always ask my students, what's a community of practice, do you think? Um, and how does it differ from a physical community? And the, the serendipitous thing here was I went, community of practice, that's what I'm spending the afternoon with a group of people who come together to share expertise, knowledge, experience. So I have community practice I can talk about. So thanks for being part of that community and for being here. Um, I know that several of you have been in our, most of you, I think, have been in our earlier sessions. You know who we are at this point. Uh, but to remind, um, I'm Maria Bond. I'm an associate professor at the School of Information Sciences at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, which some of you may have known as Gislis back in the day, but we've been under the new name for quite a while now. Um, I am accompanied and supported by Will Cross, and I will be handing the baton to him about halfway through our, our discussion today. Uh, he's the director of the Open Knowledge Center and the head of information policy at NC State University Libra Libraries. Um, and our third and very valued collaborator is Josh Bollock, who's the head of the Office of Scholarly Communication and Copyright at um, the KU Libraries in Kansas. Um, he had some really pressing family matters today and couldn't be with us. Uh, so he sends his regards. I know he's with us in spirit. He was anxiously texting me just a little while ago saying, you all okay? It's gonna be okay. We'll miss his expertise and, and his good spirit. Uh, so those are the three of us. And I wanna start just for a moment by reviewing where we've been with this series. When uh, Nick approached uh, the three of us about uh, doing you know, a, a, some kind of education about open access and then suggested it might work better as a series, I think this is quite right, than it would to just like have a big webinar where we tried to do everything. Uh, the three of us sat around and went, mm, hmm, hmm, how to structure. And we came up with this framework of education, application, and complication. Yeah. Well, we should lay, lay down some fundamentals first. And Josh led that section, as you may recall. Um, and he provided a very rich foundation, but some particular things was make sure we were sharing a common definition of open access as scholarly literature that is digital, online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and reuse uh, restrictions. I mean, he talked us through how it's generally achieved by two primary means, either by publishing openly, directly, um, or by archiving and sharing in a repository or through some other means uh, once something has been published elsewhere. I mean, he also talked us through the many motivations that scholars have uh, for participating in open access. Uh, and those uh, vary from very direct self-interest because it will help get money or it will help generate more interest in their work uh, to uh, a desire to engage more with the public, um, to have their work be free of charge, to have it be reused, redistributed, used easily in teaching. There's a number of reasons why scholars may, may be motivated to participate in open access. And there's a, a growing recognition that it's part of the evolving research culture. It's one of the things we'll be talking about today. And scholars want to be part of that. Uh, but we also recognize, and Josh talked us through some of these, that doesn't mean that there aren't concerns, worries, anxieties about open access as well. And even though we've been talking about it for, oh, let me say, a good three, de three plus decades now, uh, it's like, hmm, hmm. Do we have to work? Is this, is this thing for real? Um, and uh, scholars are concerned with the impact of publishing and participating in open culture on their promotion and tenure. They often recognize there are costs associated that they may not know how to support. Since many open access venues were new, uh, there were concerns about how legitimate they were, how prestigious they were, were they trying to take advantage of scholars in some way? And, the, and those questions continue. And there's just a lot of general con, uh, confusion. I need to put an open license on this. There are multiple open licenses. Hmm, which one? Somebody help? Uh, embargo, 
what's that? What's that mean? How long is it going to last? Can I get around it? Uh, there are just a lot of questions that scholars have. And a lot of our work as librarians is helping to address those questions and concerns, right? So that's where we began. That was the education part of our, our, our webinar series. Um, and then we'll move on to application. How does this actually work on the ground? Uh, what do we see libraries, librarians, campuses doing? How is their work changed, shaped by a desire, willingness, or requirement to participate in open access, to support open access? Uh, so we'll talk to us through some ways in which uh, libraries are using their, their purchasing power and their funding uh, to invest differently rather than just straight up subscription and licensing models, ways that might optimize openness. Um, he talked about libraries and librarians as educators and uh, helping scholars to understand this, this environment and also helping them to understand how open access and open publishing can help build their scholarly identity, can further their impact. And how do they track that? How do they identify that? How do they describe that? And he gave us some excellent examples of back to community, build, build a community, working together um, across institutional and disciplinary boundaries uh, to, to build towards the common, the common good uh, th through a focus on open access. So he got to show us lots of places where it's working. And then I don't know if I drew the short straw, it's a long one. I got complication, you know, I got the hard stuff. I got to be where we, you know, go in the weeds. Uh, what we told you when we um, described what the situation, what this, um, this webinar would address, uh, we said that open access has gained considerable traction over the last three decades. And its principles and practices are widely ap applied across scholarly disciplines. But that application in, and its adoption has surfaced a number of technical, ethical, financial issues that have complicated adoption of open access. As it's evolved, so have the possible barriers and the dilemmas that prohibit universal adoption. Uh, so this session is intended to look at some of those barriers, some of those confusions, some of the ways we're, we're in the weeds, um, and to try and help us find a way out a little bit or to believe that we can. But see, if you've been with us for all three of these sessions, you might say, uh, wait a second, you know, we've kind of been in the weeds the whole time. <laughs> because I think one theme that we've seen in our discussions and in your questions in the chat and the Q and A after, in some pre work we did, and um, some of you generously responded to a survey asking what your concerns were, is that open access is pretty complicated and has been for a while. There are requirements from institutions, there are requirements from funders, there are requirements from publishers. They may conflict. How do we resolve that? Open access gets complicated in new ways when we think, well, the journal article starts seeming like a pretty manageable unit. It's not that it's easy, easy to figure out how to open access to journal articles, but it's a, a contained unit. It's finite. And then when we start talking about things like data sets, scholarly monographs, all, kind, all kinds of scholarly outputs are the same, same kinds of questions and requirements in play. There's a, a long been a, a concern about we, we open this stuff, it's out there in the wild, somebody taking care of it? Is it still going to be around in five, 10 years or next year when I click on that link? Is it still going to be alive? Um, we've had continuing barriers to universal discoverability of open materials. Libraries have improved their ability to collect open materials and make their uh, users aware of them, but it's work in progress. Um, and there's certainly 
many questions uh, about how to support financially. Um, and we've got all kinds of possible financial models, transforming our subscription models to open, open models or pay to publish models. I think authors uh, can, can pay pub, uh, publication charges. Um, institutions or organizations can just decide it's on mission and that's what they're gonna support. Uh, but we don't have a universally accepted and adopted financial model. It's all been complicated um, and continues to be so. So we said this, um, session would be about emerging issues, and it will be, uh, but I think that there are some enduring issues that we still need to confront, acknowledge, and work together as a community of practice to address. Uh, and I think that as we see by the robust registration for this series, one enduring issue is it's just hard to keep up. Um, it's a rapidly changing, fast developing landscape and we're all busy working professionals with a lot of commitments. So like, oh, oh, what's this new thing? Quick, I have to get online. I have to find a friend. I have to get a webinar. I, it's hard to keep up. Um, that's certainly an uh, enduring issue. And I think at, at root, a lot of our enduring issues with opening access are that we, we still live in a capitalist market-driven economy for the most part. Um, and that means that there's um, economic disparity, that there's unequal access to resources, and that can limit the ability of individuals and of institutions to participate um, in open access efforts. Um, it seems trite to say things still cost money, uh, but they do, and, and navigating that and figuring out how to make that more equitable, how to spread the costs, uh, around a little bit more is an enduring issue. And an issue that's uh, endured for quite a while is the scholar's question that I, I indicated earlier. If I publish openly, if I share my work openly, does it count toward reappointment, promotion, and tenure? Does it count in the same way as if I published in a high prestige subscription journal? And I, I'm close out as an enduring issue. It was intriguing to me that when uh, Will and Josh and I were brainstorming, emerging issues, emerging issues, what are they? Uh, Will and Josh called out concerns about promotion and tenure. And I sat back as the, oh, you know, long in the tooth professional. I've been around a bit longer than they are in the profession. I was about you talking about that as the emerging issue. That was like, I've been dealing with those questions since we first um, uttered the words open access. Is this gonna, is this gonna affect my, uh, my chances for promotion and tenure? Uh, we had an ongoing joke in the community then that's probably still in play is the, uh, do shots when, when a scholar mentions promotion and tenure when we talk about open access. Okay. And we'll stagger out, we'll stagger out of the conference. So sure, it's an enduring issue. But what I begin to think about as I talked more with my collaborators is that what's emerging is not the question, but our attempts to address the question and take it seriously. And then finally, maybe we weren't just complaining about the weather. We were actually trying to do something about it. And that individual educational institutions and through consortial efforts and through organizations that support our work are all trying to look at that question. How do we take uh, openness into account in promotion and tenure? Um, how do we make it count? Um, how do we move from the old question of, will it count if it's open to, 
a better question, we think, of will it count if it's not open? How, how do we make uh, openness the preferred way? So a couple of ways that we've been doing that is that individual institutions are starting to look more seriously at how the public impact of a scholar's work uh, can contribute to their uh, promotion and tenure files. Uh, this is my, my own ex uh, institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, has just recently developed a publicly engaged researcher option that a uh, scholar who's going up for promotion or tenure can opt into what we call the PERO, the publicly engaged research option. Um, and there's a new set of requirements uh, for the dossier about what that means if you've uh, uh, elected to be a publicly engaged researcher. Um, and this is highlighted in yellow here, just a couple of those requirements. Um, that you're expected to produce both traditional and non-traditional outputs and engage in mutual, a mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources with community partners. It explicitly asks the question about whether the work that results is publicly available so that it can be reviewed by external stakeholders as part of the PNT process. And so for me, this, this is a shift. Um, it's, we're still trying to figure out how to address that. And it's really the, the first group of scholars who are opting into the PERO is just happening now. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what's provided as evidence. Um, or there are efforts like the Escala Communication Laboratory located in, in Canada at, um, at Simon Fraser and University of Ottawa. They're making a serious attempt to look at rethinking research assessment for the greater good. And that, that means taking into account how work is shared um, and who can have access to it and what the impact of that is. So those are a couple of places where we see institutions actually trying to address the question. Uh, but also, um, we're, we're lucky to have Caitlin Carter with us from, from Helios, and she'll tell us a little bit more about what that is, was they're making some very serious attempts uh, to support and incentivize institutions to look at these questions in promotion and tenure. Uh, Caitlin, are you with us? Can I turn it over to you? There you are. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So I am um, going to share a little bit about Helios Open, and that is the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Scholarship. Um, Maria kind of nailed it. We're really focused on perpetuating incentives for open scholarship practice. The um, elephant that's always in the room is really that tenure promotion review hiring conversation. Um, so I'm going to kind of focus my talk on that specifically in our work there. But I, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background just so you know, you know, what is this thing <laughs> um, and what are we doing? So um, I'm going to keep the corn metaphor alive as best I can that's going on in the chat. And so really the project started as a kernel of an idea from four presidents that participated in the National Academies Roundtable for Aligning Incentives for Open Science. And so again, having the National Academies Imprimatur as part of this is really was really important for launching the Helios Open effort. Um, these four presidents basically, you know, saw the need to get off the sidelines and to help advance some of the incentives work then change that needs to happen to recognize and reward these types of practices. So three of the presidents are still engaged in the effort. Um, and I work very closely with Gita Swami, who is our strategic lead, and Danny Anderson, who is retired and a, um, a former president of Trinity University, on engaging leadership and trying to advance some of these changes on their campus. So we represent, we have 105 members, it's campus members from across the US, it's a US focused effort. It is free for campuses to join. Um, and really, you know, for the first two years we had working groups and we asked our individuals at the time, 65 institutions, what's the number one priority related to open scholarship that you incentives, you know, tied to the round table that you think we need to work on to move the needle. And they all signed up or pretty much, you know, the number one was tenure promotion hiring, advancement, making the changes. So when the working group formed, um, it did a lot of great things, but at the end of the day, um, a lot of the, you know, I don't have the power on my campus to do this, and it's really hard navigating shared governance. And some of these, you know, really um, 
big challenges that are very real continue to come up. So I'm going to focus on before jumping to, you know, what we did to address that. I'm going to talk about some of the things that the working group did produce that were really impactful. They're quite tiny on the screen, but um, I will share a link and it's already shared in, this, in these slides as well to some of the materials here. So the first is, you know, really just a joint statement. We asked our institutions to basically articulate their values and the connection to um, open scholarship that you, you might see as, you know, an institution. Um, in the, the research that Maria showed from the RPT project, so, um, you know, Aaron McKiernan, Juan Pablo Alperin, Meredith Niles, and other co-authors, they found that, you know, when looking at, I think, 900 tenure promotion documents, Public is definitely mentioned. Um, public is, you know, a big part of, well, it's not always mentioned. It's a big part of, you know, the organizational mission, but um, where you do see it incentivized or where you see openness talked about, it's either in a, you know, predatory or bad, um, you know, something that's not, you know, negative, or you're seeing that sort of relegated to the service area of tenure and promotion, which for some is really kind of the not as valued as the other two, you know, research and teaching areas. And the work within that open space is often done by um, underrepresented researchers. And so it's really not a fair, equitable system. And so again, in trying to address that, we articulated our values, connected it to the institution, but institutions were really reluctant to say, well, we commit to doing anything about it. So we, we paused for a minute um, and, you know, in the Nelson Memorandum, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit later on, but that's really, you know, federal public access policies came out saying, you know what, all federally funded research will soon be made publicly available at the time of publication, you know, in service of public access. And so when that news came out in August 2022, that these new requirements were going to be coming down new for some agencies, we seized the moment and we said, hey, leaders, pay attention to this. You know, your compliance efforts could be aligned with some of the practices that your researchers are already doing. And shouldn't we incentivize that type of activity as it serves the public? So going back to, you know, what we did about this sort of lack of, you know, wanting to take action and who on the campus is the right person and how do we navigate shared governance? And it's happening in some areas, but not others. We put together a workshop that was NASA funded through Florida International University. And we basically asked some of the individuals in our network who have taken steps or who are actually changed their tenure promotion guidelines within their school or department, what they did. What are your first few steps? And we brought this to leadership. We had 50 presidents, provosts, and vice presidents for research show up to a workshop in Miami to talk about their role in perpetuating culture change and change that basically explicitly incentivizes open science and open scholarship practices. Next slide, Maria. So if you keep clicking through, sorry, this is a moving slide. You can see that, you know, one of the things that we talked about with the support of Danny Anderson, who came and facilitated this meeting. So he is, you know, the former president of Trinity University, and he has experience in executive leadership since his retirement. And he talked to the leaders, he met them at their level and said, there are lots of models for complex change and things you need to think about. And when you are lacking one of these things, there's a lot of challenges with the change. And so having this conversation framed this way, giving them examples of what this, the steps that leaders took, um, the policy language that some of them incorporated into their documents was really impactful, but so too is having a conversation about how you go about change and what to think about when you're doing it from the leadership level. I'm gonna turn it back over to Maria. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, this is, I think, an encouraging culture shift. Mm -hmm. right. So that's an issue that has endured, but is also emerging. And I think that the requirements that funders are play, are attaching uh, to to their grant awards the funding that too is both enduring and and ever emerging the uh i was i was trying to recall and chatting with will a bit the other day but like yeah when did when did the rubber really start hitting the road uh with a funding agency saying we expect open access uh to the results of this uh funded research and that, mm, yeah National Institutes of Health, and that was, I have to go back and check, but 2007. Um, and that 
when the National Institute of Health began to require open access for the research they funded. And then sort of moved along into the Obama era and in 2013, uh, the ac increasing access to the results of federally funded scientific research. Uh, when the research funded by the large funding agencies began to attach requirements uh, for openness to the awards and has continued to move along. And Caitlin just referred to what is usually called the Nelson Memo on ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally fund funded research. Like, wait, those are different. The, wor the words are kind of the same, uh, but is in fact a more expansive uh, and quicker path uh, to open access to research. Uh, so this has been developing over the course of, you have to do the math, but uh, we're working on 20 years now, still a little ways off from 20 years. Uh, and that's a very North American perspective. It's the what I thought of, it's the path that I have walked the most. But of course, it's not just um, North American and United States. There's another part of North America, our friends in Canada. And as my our Canadian uh, participants here to forgive me, I'm like, I'm trying to just, you probably are too, but I'm trying to get my head about the around the tri-agency open access policy for publications. The, uh, the, the agencies or the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And they've coordinated on an open access policy requiring researchers to provide broad public access to articles resulting from funded research. So that's going on in, in, in Canada. And of course, things are going on in Europe too. Um, and really internationally, I've, these are just a few examples, right? Uh, Plan S has been at work since 2018. Uh, it was launched by Coalition S. Uh, and most lately I've been hearing the claim that S stands for shock, although there seems to have been several uh, possible um, uh, meanings for that abbreviation. Uh, but that was a consortium of, op of um, na national research agencies and funders from originally 12 European countries uh, and tent on uh, requiring research who benefit from state-funded research organizations and institutions to publish their work in open repositories or in journals that are available. And their goal was to do this by 2021. And I believe that that too is still a work in progress. So all these requirements, they're not all the same, but they kind of boil down to access to funding and other resources being tied to requirements for openness. And underlying it is this is a question, well, forever we had publishers requiring that you assign your copyright if you want to pu publish your work with them. So why can't Funders have requirements too. Why can't they require that you make the results of your research openly available? So this has had direct access, a direct impact on our work as, as librarians and as libraries and the organizations that support them. It's not surprising that funding is a major driver for our own scholarship and for the, for the scholars we support. And, and scholars acknowledge and recognize the importance of compliance and of participating, but they also know it takes work to do it. Um, and I think that's where, that's where we can help. That's where we are helping. And we can help by navigating the landscape of open access repositories and by helping authors to, to choose the one that's most appropriate for their work and that will get it the most recognition. We can help authors understand versioning requirements. Which which version of my work? Does it has to be the final, copy edited, formally published? Uh, helping them to understand what, what they can and should deposit in order to share their work. We can help them to read, understand, and maybe even negotiate publishing contracts. And I think that 
And this is uh, the slide was just intended to uh, illustrate the plethora of requirements out there. Um, I'll talk in a moment, just a moment about resources. Um, I think we should also see that it has an impact on our work in providing opportunities. And it's kind of a, 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 a truism, a cons consolatory uh, truism these days. This is not a problem, it's an opportunity. Uh, but there are actually opportunities here to build new relationships with scholars, uh, to demonstrate our expertise and our relevance, to be part of the research enterprise. Um, it's an opportunity to uh, to build new relationship with research offices on campus and the people who work in them, as we all try to understand the division of labor and the roles and responsibilities in ensuring compliance and ensuring the success of our scholars' work, as well as ensuring that the, the funding keeps coming in. So it really is complicated. That was the theme for today. It's complicated. Um, and there's a lot to learn. But we should also remind ourselves that we're not alone, um, that there's a community of practice here working on developing uh, resources and and eager to share those that can help us to understand that. Um, and I'm sure our friends at Spark are probably working on this as we speak. Um, you can see that in 2022, they updated the OST policy guide it's 24, and I suspect, I suspect we're going to see that reflected soon. Uh, but there's also the community of libraries and librarians working on this. Uh, here's just a couple of examples I pulled very quickly, because like these are nice. Uh, this is from the Scholar Communication Office at Duke, uh, helping their researchers to understand the new federal agency pu public access requirements and what it means for them. And similarly, colleagues at, at UBC, Helping, helping their scholars understand what, are the, what is this tri-agency open access policy? How, how can the library help? So there are resources out there and you have each other as resources. You have us as resources, uh, all the people on this on the call. Um, so I started out, we were in the weeds. It was actually a corn maze, right? Uh, we're not out yet. Right. But we have company, we have company, and uh, as we as we wander around in that maze, um, and right now I'm going to hand it over to Will, who's going to uh, guide us through the next few twists and turns. So thank you, Maria. Company in the corn maze is a is a great subtitle for this presentation. Um, so thanks everybody for being here today. I've seen some good conversations in the chat and also in those the Q and A section as well. Um, please do keep adding those questions. We'll, we'll address them as we go, and then there'll be some time at the end as well. Um, so quickly, in addition to those questions about incentives and funders that Maria did a great job of talking about and that Caitlin talked some about as well, another issue that's been in the mix since we began discussing OA but has remained challenging is the way that law and policy impact knowledge production. Uh, there's plenty going on right now. Um, just this last week, we got a decision in the Internet Archive case in the States that's that's uh, telling us some new and important things about how fair use fits in with, with scholarship and knowledge in different ways. Um, around the globe, we're dealing with this assault on intellectual freedom through book bans and, and content challenges in different ways. So there's a lot we could talk about today, but we wanted this afternoon to focus on three major issues related to information policy. The first is the ongoing adoption of surveillance capitalism by the for-profit actors in our spaces and the pressures that come from that. The second is the, the rise of generative AI and the sort of the, the new questions that asks and the, the maybe some stark disagreements in the open community about what that means for our work. Uh, and then finally, the ongoing platformization of OA infrastructure in different ways. So I'll talk a bit now about the first two of those, and then I'm going to tag in Nick to talk about the third and some of the great work that Spark has been doing there. So next slide, please, Maria. Oh, they're not not advancing. Hold on. Uh -oh. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so, so the privacy discussion obviously has always been a core value of librarianship, and it's also been a necessary predicate predicate for the ethical open scholarship that we want to support when we talk about open access in different ways. 
But as a field, we're still grappling with the fact that, that many, most, all of the major players understand the data they gather as one of the core value at issue equal to content in a lot of different ways. Um, if you haven't read Sarah Lambden's great book, uh, she does a, a really nice job of walking through, the, through this in both a th sort of thoughtful researcher and in a personal narrative way. But she talks about this recognition that, hey, these people who bring nice tote bags to us, that, that's not really what they're about. There are these other things happening as well. So I, I point to that as a great resource to, to think about these issues. Uh, but on the next slide, Maria, I also point to it as something that that the large um, players in the field have been pretty explicit about. Um, although we sometimes in OA land talk about the quote, big publishers as people who were involved in the process. In fact, folks like Elsevier have described themselves to shareholders and also to the public for nearly a decade as a data analytics companies in different ways, right? That for them content is co-equal at best to data. So to the extent that open access was initially focused on removing paywalls or even placing an open license that permits use, the OA movement has not addressed some of the core issues in law, economics, and in, in the sort of liberatory and dignitary hopes of open access that we're committed to as well. So recognizing who we're dealing with is an important part of that conversation. And then on the next slide, understanding sort of the specifics of what that looks like. Um, there's been a ton of good work on this space. We could spend the whole hour, hour and a half just looking at great privacy and surveillance capitalism work. Um, but I wanted to point, point, point to this report by Becky Use, which documents the level of tracking done by one tool in particular, Science Direct. It's a striking illustration of the way that our data is gathered, monetized, and shared in a lot of new contexts. As somebody who works some on intellectual freedom issues, the idea that my searches might be shared with law enforcement is pretty scary in a lot of ways. Um, so significantly in terms of open access, seeding control of the data and analytics piece is an issue because we seed the ability to tell the story about the values and the impact of our work. Nobody should want a world where scholars are evaluated based on a hypothetical E index as determined by Elsevier, right? Um, data is a, is a resource that has financial value. It's also genuine information about people that can be very personal and private in different ways. And it's also a tool for making some of the big important decisions that drive the issues that we talk about when we talk about open access. So really thinking about all those things in terms of scholarship is really, really important. And on the, next, on the next slide, I wanted to note that um, it's important in other spaces as well. These issues aren't limited to Elsevier or Wexis or whoever your favorite um, database provider is. If your work is in any way connected to student success, to open education, or to open infrastructure, these conversations, I'm sure, are incredibly familiar to you. And in fact, a lot of the problems with open access and privacy are amplified in uh, places like the EdTech space, where students have even less agency to address and respond to the surveillance that they're put under and the way that their data is used in different ways. So what do we do about that? Um, I, I wish I had a perfect solution, but on the next slide, I, I begin to suggest a couple of places to go. Um, an important step that's already happening is support for transparency and understanding of these issues. I've been a big fan of the Library Freedom Project's work for a long time, and I'm pointing here to their work on vendor agreements. Um, which I think is really, really valuable. That's also a nice place to go for related policy topics. Uh, I teach an LIS course every spring focused on information policy, and students always appreciate things like their guidance on the concrete privacy issues, such as responding to law enforcement demands for library re records, right? If the cops show up at the desk at 7 p.m., what do you do about that is a, is a really uh, concrete example of these often abstract feeling privacy concerns. So, th so those sort of resources are really, really valuable. On the next slide, I'll also um, point to some work that Spark has been doing. If you're interested in these issues and, and wanna sort of stay up to date and, and add what's happening on your campus, I recommend the Spark community of practice focused on privacy and surveillance as well. That's some really good stuff that's happening and a good place to go to, to learn more and to join the conversation in that way. So that's the privacy and surveillance stuff. On the next slide, I'm going to fulfill my, my obligation. I think there's been a new law passed that says you cannot give a presentation in 2024 without talking about AI. So I'm going to do that here and now. Um, and, and just to note that depending on who you ask, AI is some combination of a world changing opportunity, a world ending crisis, or just another bit of VC funded hot air. Um, and I'm, I welcome all those perspectives. I'm probably somewhere in the middle myself. But regardless of how you feel about AI as a thing, it is raising some core questions about 
uh, scholarship, knowledge, and openness, that these ideas we've been talking about in terms of what is creation that we value, how do we give appropriate credit to the folks who do the creating, and what sort of control do we want to assert and what sort of control do we want to let go of in scholarship, AI really asks us to think about those in some new and significant ways. And I think at some level, there's sort of a battle of the metaphors going on with AI right now. I think a, a certain set of people have seen AI and gone, this feels like the World Wide Web in the 90s. This feels like a new and exciting thing that's going to be good, bad, or indifferent, but is going to change things in pretty significant ways. And I think there are another set of people who have seen this and gone like, this, this smells a lot more like blockchain or NFTs or some sort of, you know, low value nonsense that we don't need to worry about too much. And again, I'm not here to tell you which of those you should think it is, but I think that that battle about the metaphors is half of a big conversation about AI. And I think the other half is even more important because I think generative artificial intelligence is putting into sharp relief an ongoing conversation in the open community about what openness is for. Um, if you go back 100 years ago or you know however long ago and ask about what's what's happening with openness in uh, when the Budapest Open Access Initiative is passed, there's this big conversation about um, free as in speech versus free as in beer. Is openness about removing paywalls and letting as many people in as possible? Or is it about enacting a set of values that are a response to late capitalism and the rise of sort of for-profit forces? And I think the way you feel about AI partly is guided by whether you think this is the new World Wide Web or the new blockchain. But I think part of it is also guided by whether this feels like a way to enact your sort of gratis values of opening up access and more people in the pool is good versus how much this feels like it's in tension with your sort of liber inclusive values of returning agency to individual people and pushing back on for-profit actors. So I think those big questions that have always been there in open access are brought into sharp relief by AI in particular. Uh, very quickly, I'll point to a couple of spaces where I think we're seeing these conversations happen on the next slide. Um, I will note that OA is navigating some of these questions on several fronts. If you've been following the news or if you're on any form of social media, you've seen any number of articles discussing the use of scholarly literature being used to train AI. And regardless of your feelings about the underlying technology, if you've worked in OA for any amount of time, you probably were not, as it says here, shocked to hear that the works signed away to poor for-profit publishers are being used to generate value for those publishers. This is a really great moment and a really nice invitation to reassert the importance of scholars retaining and asserting their rights in different ways, right? My, my response to a lot of these art articles has been, read your publication agreements. <laughs> Don't sign them until they say what you want. Something I've been shouting at people about for many, many years at this point. So, so another opportunity to sort of reassert uh, the value of scholars and scholar agency in this space. On the next slide, I talk a little bit about the other side of the research life cycle. Um, if you work in a library, you've probably heard something about the flurry of new licensing language related to AI. Um, on my own campus, I've seen a, a pretty wide spectrum for this stuff. I've seen versions that are about permission for libraries and scholars to train or to search licensed databases, sort of the, the children and grandchildren of the text and data mining work that we've been doing for a pretty good while at this point. On the other side of the house, I've seen some attempts to lock users into a bundled proprietary version of Elsevier's AI or Taylor and Francis's AI. Um, the way we respond to those issues is going to look different, but that's that's a, another way that it's been impacting the sort of day to day um, open access work that we have been doing. And then finally, on the last slide, I'm going to take one moment to jump onto a soapbox. Um, and say that that we're in early stages and all of our various communities need to keep having these hard conversations about what we want from our tools, how we build and recognize knowledge, and what sort of control we want to assert over the tools that we use. But I want to suggest one thing to you, and that is that we look very any proposal that is grounded in strengthening copyright control. For those folks who are concerned about AI, it might be tempting to step away from openness and say, if openness is making too much money for Microsoft or OpenAI, I don't know if we can trust openness. Um, I would look critically at those, at those impulses. And in particular, if what you're hearing is a call for some new laws that we need to claim ownership in ideas or facts or style or those things that have not been protected so much in the past, or we really need to cut back on fair use and fair dealing because they're, they're empowering the AI folks too much, I hope you will take a second look at those things and recognize 
uh, some of the things that it says here, recognize that propertization of information and ownership has always benefited the people with structural power at the expense of those without structural power. That if you create a new property right in the idea represented in a journal article, um, that is going to redound to the folks who just got another round of VC funding for several trillion dollars. That's not going to redound to the benefit of individual scholars. Um, that to the extent that a lot of the lawsuits right now are about moving the money around, I think it's important not to let openness and the values that we all share sort of get lost in that process. And in particular, to not let the idea of ethical AI get co-opted to mean as long as you write a check to somebody, you're behaving ethically. Um, we've seen this with the propertization of privacy information, and it's, it never goes very well, um, to recognize that when we talk about ethical issues, what we're talking about are inclusion and equity, access, labor, agency, due process, and surveillance, but not to read ethical as not fair dealing, not to read ethical as, well, I wrote a check to Elsevier, so I'm behaving ethically. Um, if nothing else, I hope wherever we land on AI, we land on sustaining our commitment to openness and not shutting all that down because we don't like this, the set of people that are in the space right now. And that's more time than I meant to spend on my soapbox. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that all of these issues, privacy, copyright licensing, and other related issues are drawn together in a really significant way as we are seeing this moved into walled gardens controlled by for-profit corporations that exacerbates all of those issues. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Nick to talk a little bit about the role of platformization in OA, and then I think Maria is going to bring us home and get into some of the great questions that I'm excited to check out. Such a cheery topic to, to end on. <laughs> um, and Maria, you can go to the, the next slide. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to spend a, a moment to talk about another important issue that as Will was referencing, uh, you know, to the future of open access, which really is the emergence of research platforms. And I think going back to Maria's earlier slide about, you know, sort of the, you know, sort of begin, beginning of funder policies in sort of the mid 2000s. Um, you know, I sort of see the emergence of platformizations as an issue, um, you know, that's really starting to come to the forefront that's going to be a driver for the next, you know, the coming decades, uh, you know, of, of you know, sort of the open research movement. And, you know, just to define the term uh, that I'm using by platforms, um, what I'm specifically talking about are suites of products and services that are offered by a single vendor across the full research lifecycle. So from literature review and discovery to publication to research assessment, even to you know, faculty information systems and even university rankings. And uh, the image here that some of you may have seen uh, um, is from 2018, two early career researchers at the University of Toronto Scarborough, Alejandro Posada and George Chen, along with their advisor, Leslie Chen, uh, published this map of the academic knowledge production process. And on top of it, as you can see, they overlaid um, the, that process with the products offered by one, uh, one vendor in this particular case, Elsevier. And you know, I think the main takeaway from this image is, as you can see, uh, they found that they're relevant Elsevier products at nearly every stage of the knowledge production process. And you know, I think you and the faculty that you work with, even some of the students, uh, you know, are likely very familiar with these products individually and may use many of them on a regular um, or even da daily basis. Uh, yet, when you think about them as a whole um, and how they're distributed across uh, the research lifecycle, uh, the effects that an emerging platform, uh, an emerging research platform like Elsevier can have become much more uh, than its individual parts. So, you know, for example, the advantages and opportunities that uh, are presented by owning a leading discovery product like ScienceDirect uh, are significant. Uh, as the owner, uh, you know, of one of these platforms, a company could access granular data about not only how much work is, is viewed, uh, but by whom, by what institutions they're from, uh, how they engage with the work, et cetera. Um, you know, better understanding this potential for data collection uh, you know, was a driving motivation for the science direct analysis that, that was mentioned earlier. And so when the same company also owns a research analytics business or a variety of research analytics businesses, you can imagine the opportunity uh, that this could present to generate new metrics products for institutions, um, you know, that might be advertised to give them a competitive advantage through things like insights into early impact years before they're visible in a citation graph. You know, so who is reading an article and how they engage could be baked into these kinds of new metrics. 
you know, you can imagine a similar pitch to funders, both in guiding future grants and assessing current and past awards. You know, and while I don't uh, have time to delve into a detail here, there are similar ways that products at different points in the research lifecycle could be similarly leveraged. And I also want to be clear here that I'm not implying that Elsevier is currently engaged in these actions. Uh, however, the fact uh, that it is increasingly possible for one company to do so should be very carefully considered by the research community. And so, you know, sort of looking at this graph, uh, you know, if one company owns products with a substantial adoption rate across key stages of the research lifecycle, it really does create a qualitative shift in the role that company can play. And that's where the term platform or platformization becomes apt. Uh, you know, if one company has significant influence over how individuals find and access academic information, uh, over publications in the publication process, over research analytics and metrics, over faculty information systems, uh, over even things like university rankings, that company really shouldn't be viewed as simply a publisher or, you know, an individual service provider, um, but really as an intermediary in the research process itself. And as research platforms mature, it becomes increasingly uh, difficult to avoid engaging with at least parts of them when conducting research, um, you know, especially as some pieces like analytics products or faculty information systems are largely out of individuals' controls. So, you know, the company that owns all these uh, you know, sort of different pieces, their role becomes much closer uh, to that of other online platform businesses, such as Google, you know, which is an intermediary between, you know, those searching and websites they may visit. Uh, or Amazon, which is an intermediary between consumers and products they may purchase. You know, so particularly, um, you know, given the rightful scrutiny on other tech companies, uh, you know, we should really carefully examine the potential for negative impacts of similarly structured businesses uh, in the research and education environments, uh, you know, and honestly, whether they should be allowed to exist at all. And while, you know, especially because we're running short on time, I won't delve into detail, but Spark is actively working uh, to address the risks associated with platformization uh, of research in a number of ways, you know, it includes everything from better understanding the potential uh, for data collection that drives these platforms like the Science Direct report to supporting libraries to take action um, in addressing privacy risks uh, through the privacy and surveillance community practice. Um, you know, also things like you know, educating regulators like the FTC and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau about these risks, you know, taking action to oppose relevant, you know, mergers and acquisitions when they take place. Uh, but lastly, I'll just say, you know, the broader work that Spark does and that so many people on this call are doing, uh, you know, from policy advocacy to strengthening repositories to negotiating more assertively, you know, all also fundamentally address the risks uh, posed by these platforms by strengthening community aligned uh, and community governed. Uh, so while there are lots of risks, um, you know, with the emergence of these platforms, the community is already very active um, in taking a variety of different steps um, in addressing, you know, these, these issues directly, but also building a wider ecosystem that, you know, protects privacy, um, you know, and is much more diverse um, than, you know, sort of relying on a single uh, research platform. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back to Maria to close this out. Thank you. Fascinating. I love looking at this graphic, but you can get lost in it. Um, so it's all perfectly clear right now, right? Right? We, we, I don't know if you all caught that, but Will's cat is apparently going to guide us out of the corn maze. He was there volunteering at one point during uh, uh, Will's discussion about artificial intelligence. Um, the questions we'd like to ask you as we continue the series is, well, you know, as if you've been with us, what have you learned? And what do you still go kind of like, huh? What, well, I don't get it. Um, and to ask us all to think together about what comes next in terms of concrete action to support openness and what's coming next to challenge us. Because uh, remember, keeping up is an enduring issue. Um, and you know, by this time tomorrow, you might be scurrying to do some research to keep up with the next development. So I would, I would say, you know, keep in mind that opening access is complicated and it's a long process. And it's a, a, we've come a long way and there's a long way to go. Um, and this quote, uh, I first came across this when I was working in early digital library development and I stumbled into the office of one of our developers to ask about a problem, you know, some search interface I was working on. And I found him with his head in his hands muttering, start where you are, start where you are. 
I said, Alan, Alan what's up? what are you saying? And he said, oh, you know, the Arthur Ashe thing. I didn't know the Arthur Ashe thing, but the Arthur Ashe quote, which I've now seen in many places, and I find so appropriate for so many areas of life. It, the complete quote is, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. And that's what I would urge you to consider. Where are you? What do you got? You got each other. Uh, we're resources for each other and, and do what you can. So what are some things you ca can do? And we've shared these ideas with you in our earlier sessions. You can be an advocate. You can be an educator. Get to leadership as in your colleagues as often as you can and speak up about the benefits of openness and the resources required to realize those benefits. Help your faculty understand their contracts. Help them to understand sharing policies and funder requirements. I mean, you might consider taking part in Open Access Week, which is October 21st through 27th through some programming or events. Um, and the theme th this year is community over commercialization. Uh, these links will all be in the slides. You, you can you can find more there. Uh, something else you can do is you can continue learning. As, as Nick said at the beginning, we're having another event in this series on September 30th um, to uh, to be in, in keeping with support um, Open Access Week activities um, on answering common questions from scholars. We have some ideas about what those questions are, but I bet you have a lot of them. And if you can share them with us, that would be wonderful, either by sticking around um, or by emailing one of us or emailing Nick, who will pass them on to us. So that, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming in and being with us through this. And now we'd love to open it up for some conversation. Uh, I haven't been able to see the chat and the Q&A, but I know Will's been keeping a good eye on it. So I'll stop sharing the slides and let's have a look at each other. Thank you, Maria. And I'll say, I know we're a little over the hour, so if you have to go, you won't hurt our feelings or anything, but we're we're super, ha super happy to answer the questions that have already been shared um, and, and happy to hear some more in chat or otherwise here as well. So quickly, I'll, I'll jump into one that, that was addressed towards the, the privacy piece in particular. Uh, Kate asks, I see how surveillance capitalism is an, is an issue, but I'm not sure I see how it relates to OA. Can we clarify? And I'll offer an answer to that, but Nick and Maria, I'm sure, and Caitlin too, I'm sure you have good answers as well. I'll say I think there are at least two pieces for it. The first is to the extent that the agreements that we sign for licensing materials um, makes that possible that we have an opportunity as actors in the open access space to um, either permit that to happen or to push back in different ways. And I think that's important for everybody because privacy is important for everybody, but particularly in an environment where surveillance is used to harm um, precarious scholars, minoritized scholars, and scholars that are doing the open and public work that we really hope is going to happen more and more with open access, that the, the ability to control the way your data is handled and used and shared with other folks um, it can either be a, a benefit to or a do real harm to the open values that we hope our scholars will put forward. So that's m sort of my answer to that, but Maria and Nick, I'm, I'm curious what you all would say about that. Yeah, happy to to jump in. And you know, by way of answering this question, I wonder if you may be sharing a bit about Spark's journey to focus on privacy might be helpful. Um, you know, so sort of this came to light for Spark when we sort of increasingly recognized the need to think about privacy in a similar way that we think about equity, right, as something that needs to be built into the foundation of the future for open research rather than like something to worry about down the line that it should inform like how we at our core approach um, this work and that we you know didn't want to reach a future for open research that was sort of open as in Facebook, where, you know, you can access things nominally for free, but you're paying for them in very real ways that are often very intrusive. Um, you know, and just projecting out the way that, you know, large publishers were starting to think of themselves as information analytics companies, um, you know, we started to, you know, just pay closer attention to, um, you know, sort of the, the compromises, um, you know, to privacy, you know, that come broadly with, you know, the shift to online systems, uh, but how that was starting to play out in the research space, um, you know, and so it took us some time to get our feet underneath us to sort of understand this environment. 
um, to sort of articulate what a role for Spark is, um, you know, around privacy, which isn't, you know, an issue that people typically associated with, you know, sort of Spark, like the open research, the open education people. Um, but we realized, you know, we really needed to be, you know, sort of weaving this into our work to make sure, you know, that we actually reach our end goal, which is an assistant that's just open, but one that's also fundamentally equitable. Um, you know, we view, you know, sort of systems that respect folks' privacy as, you know, sort of part and parcel of, you know, systems that that are equitable. And as we've, you know, sort of delved into this topic, it's become clearer and clearer, you know, the increasing extent of both, uh, you know, collection and monetization, uh, you know, of user data and the way that that can be, you know, monetized between different business lines, um, you know, that are not only like concerning for, you know, like the data uses that, you know, may negatively impact, you know, faculty or may, you know, violate libraries, privacies related to, to privacy, but they also could have significant effects on things like consolidation, um, right, if one vendor is hoovering up lots and lots of user data and say discovery platform, um, you know, that gives them information that they can then use in a publications business to identify fields that may be right for a journal um, before anybody else to identify editors or reviewers or others and recruit them before anyone else, um, you know, to scoop them from others. Um, you know, so that's just another example of how, you know, you can use data from, you know, sort of one part of the research life cycle to benefit another, but there are lots and lots of them. Um, but hopefully that gives you a sense of, um, you know, sort of how, um, you know, the increasing amount of data collection, um, you know, that sort of falls under that umbrella of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, what Will was getting at re related to surveillance capitalism, um, you know, is, is pretty central, uh, is a pretty central issue for the future of open research. Sorry, that was way longer than I was intending. I'm gonna get off my soapbox. But really helpful, Nick. So, so another question here is how do we talk to faculty about the truthiness of metrics? And Maria, I'm interested since you teach, teach folks to have these conversations, how do you help your students think about talking to faculty and how do you talk to your fellow faculty about metrics as giving some information, but maybe that being imperfect or flawed or maybe even dangerous information in some ways. It would, um, I don't know if any of you saw several years ago now, it was a participant in the Hyde Park debate at Charleston. And the uh, topic for the debate was alt metrics are overrated. Um, and I don't think it was fair because I had to debate a Scotsman wearing a kilt. I mean, it was it was I was it sounded exactly like Sean Connery. It was all over right there. Uh, but my my way of approaching the debate was it's not that all metrics are overrated; it's that all metrics are overrated. Um, and what I uh, you know I was being jocular, uh, but that what I, I sort of said you know it's it's about metrics, but it's more about the stories we tell with the metrics. Uh, we have some extraordinarily popular classes in my program now that are called data storytelling, which is you got those numbers. Now, what do they mean? Um, how can you shape a narrative around them? Um, also, we do data visualization in those classes. Uh, and that's one thing I like to um, engage my students in is saying, okay, we have various metrics. And we talk about how those are collected and the history of citation counts and things like that. And then we look at things that are uh, co collected through various you know, you know, impact story and alt metrics and the, the various companies that, that surface other kinds of metrics. And I say like, how, how can we assemble these pieces collectively to tell a compelling story about impact? And uh, that's one of the things I'm interested in that uh, publicly engaged research option I showed that's just coming into being at my university uh, because that's part of what they're doing is like how do you how do you tell the story uh, if it's not just about what other scholars cited your work and so that's one way that that I do and always it's just a, you know we have to have a exercise our critical facilities and asking questions about the metrics how they're collected who they serve are they collected by for-profit agencies? For what purposes? Um, and to, to come to those stories, so it's another. It's a long-winded way of saying it's complicated, but but they are. What about you? What do you think? Well, it's a great answer, Maria, and probably more robust than mine. I'll say 
I teach a, a regular workshop on scholarly identity, and I bet a lot of people have a story like this. And one of the slides that I use is there's a famous article, the title of which is, is the something, 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 some long time scientific term question mark. And the abstract is no. <laughs> and it was shared all over social media. So it's alt metric score is off the charts. So if you were to say, oh, is this paper impactful? Like, oh my God, this is the most impactful paper ever written. But in fact, everybody shared it because it has a funny joke in it. It wasn't shared because it was an amazing paper. It was shared because it made people smile. And that's valid, but that's a nice way to get into the conversation of like, is, is that impact in a way that, that we really want to select for in terms of promotion and tenure and such? Um, and so that's, that's a, often a fun way to get into the conversation of like, all metrics reflect a number, right? You, you, you can create a, you know, a calculation and then spit a number out of it, but that number only selects for the stuff that you told it to select for, if that makes sense. So just giving a factual description of like, this is the math for how your H index is calculated. Um, is that all we need to think about? Is that sufficient? And immediately people go like, of course, no, there are many other factors as well. So just sort of demystifying the, the perceived magic of the number with some funny examples, I find is often a way to get them to, there's something there, but it's not any more than, than sort of the math behind it. And if I could jump in there, I mean, I, one would also be very interested if, uh, you know, if there's anything that, you know, surface from Helios open, um, you know, sort of on the question of, you know, sort of metrics, because I know that's been yeah. such a topic with, you know, yeah. the roundtables discussion. Um, sorry, before Caitlin, putting on Caitlin on the spot, I wanted to give her life in the morning, because uh, I am going to say something else. <laughs> um, but you know, just one other thing that I wanted to flag that's maybe tangentially related, but in my mind, there's a, a connection, which is, um, you know, last year, our ACL Spark Forum focused on uh, members of editorial boards that had resigned. And one of the issues that came up, you know, there was, you know, sort of the challenge of leaving, you know, their, you know, sort of the original imprimatur that had things like, you know, impact factors attached to them um, and starting something new where the whole community came with it, but sort of the shell of the journal kept you know, sort of these nominal rankings, even if the real heart of the publication, um, you know, sort of transferred to the, the new journal. And uh, I recently caught up with some of the folks that participated in that. And one of the, the things that they shared, uh, you know, for imaging neuroscience, which is one of those journals, um, is that they've put up uh, an impact statement um, that sort of tries to directly get at this issue by speaking to how this journal um, you know, basically kind of, you know, just speaking to, you know, how it was formed, um, you know, in the community that's come with it to start it and, you know, sort of explaining that transition and how, you know, it might look like a new journal, but it's actually, um, you know, has a legacy, um, you know, that, that goes beyond that to try to offset that issue with metrics, uh, you know, and allow folks that may need to be more sensitive to those metrics for whatever reason um, to still publish in the new journal Imaging Neuroscience. Um, so yeah, I just want to share that because I think it's an interesting way around, um, sort of that, that issue. I'll also just say I love, uh, the intentional use of the word truthiness, uh, there it's like, uh, it's a perfect way to encapsulate, uh, the issue with metrics. Um, uh, yeah, Caitlin would be, would love to hear if there's sort of anything that's cropped up there on that Helios. Sure. And thank you for the plenty of lead in time to sort my thoughts on that. Um, yeah. So, you know, one of the frustrating th things that I've heard, you know, not just in my career as a librarian, but also in, in leading the Helios open effort and working with leaders and folks both who need to be sold on the idea that we need to make some of these changes to our policies and processes and reward systems. Um, but also the ones who are like, yeah, totally, but how? Um, so one of the frustrating things is basically like we, you know, this is a vice president for research speaking saying, I know the H index is a poor metric to use to assess our researchers, but it's the best one I've got. It's easy to count papers. I do not have time to read all of the articles that come from like my vast, you know, department or group of um, researchers in which I'm assessing. So a lot of our effort is, you know, obviously there are problems with that. And I think, you know, this person is someone who, you know, is really interested in advancing changes. So I think, you know, a lot of our conversation is in exploring and actions are in exploring, you know, um, so what interest from the leaders at least is like, so what do we value instead? So they're really interested in hearing examples of like, 
So you're saying that some departments or schools recognize contributions to software, open software, code sharing, data. Let's look at the policy language. So rather than, so it's more focused on sort of like the, sh the research outputs that are shared rather than on the metrics. Um, and when you look at a lot of policies, yes, there's still, you know, that H impact GIF, but they all vary. And so in looking, diving into the actual policy, sometimes that's just sort of like used by default, but it might not be explicit. And so we're advocating for like explicit mention of, you know, sharing public, you know, and how will you assess that um, in the actions that they do? So I don't know if that really answers it, but it's definitely a frustrating thing to try to get around knowing that they're busy, recommending, you know, read have the researcher um, nominate the three articles that, you know, or the two that were really impactful, they think are impactful and let them tell you why and read them. It's um, a little bit more productive of a conversation. Valuable. Nick, I see you'd like to answer a question live. Do you want to go ahead and answer that now? I realized I should have just typed the answer to the question, but <laughs> yes. Uh, so someone had asked if there will be more um, webcasts on ethical AI, um, you know, open access and data privacy practices. Uh, and we do have some things in the work, not announced yet, but um, we'll definitely have things that will be responsive to that um, over the, uh, the coming months, both around, you know, sort of better understanding issues related to, um, you know, both privacy as it comes to library vendors, as well as, you know, sort of larger privacy concerns. Um, and you know, AI also continues to be a you know, sort of very high priority internally for supporting um, you know, Spark members. We did a session at, earlier this year on sort of vendor AI restrictions, and I plugged the recap um, of that in the chat earlier. Uh, but we're looking at you know, what we might also do um, related to that, just given how quickly it's evolving with you know, sort of vendors trying to force libraries to you know accept terms prohibiting the use of ai on licensed products um you know that are quite concerning from a variety of reasons and you know um there have been you know sort of differing success rates at folks uh pushing back uh on uh, on that but some institutions have been successful so you know we're looking at how we can best share those experiences uh you know out and support folks in effectively pushing back on on those restrictions thank you nick and i dropped a link to that as well from kyle which is always fun um while we're talking i'm, I'm interested there's a question that I've, I've seen in a lot of different places which is whether and how the use of llms to train widely is impacting people's perception of openness and open access in particular i made an argument a few minutes ago that it shouldn't be because one if training is fair use or fair dealing um the openness or closeness of your stuff doesn't matter but two if you're signing all your rights away to a, a publisher whatever rights you had to limit it are gone anyway um but I could still imagine some people saying, this makes me feel, the situation is different. I feel different about it. So I'm curious, Maria and Nick, if you have heard anecdotally or otherwise reports of people saying, I was a big open proponent, but this AI thing is just too squicky. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up all the walls I can to keep people from using it. No, I, I think that, I think what I've heard from my scholarly colleagues mostly is, well, if it's gonna happen, I want my stuff in there because I'm smart and I can make I can make that artificial intelligence more intelligent, right? That they, they want that work reflected in the, the training of the large language models. Haven't heard too many concerns. The, the loss of control is always, you know, from the time we're little kids, right? Is always perplexing, frightening. Uh, I want to hold on to control. So there's always questions about, okay, am I allowing this? Is it my call? Those kinds of things. Uh, larger questions of control, but I haven't heard too much concern. Um, I've heard more concern about how do we make sure it it's goes back to the discoverability question of open materials. How do we make sure that the good open materials are taken into account in training so that AI is smarter? I don't know. I do you hear different things, Nick? These are kind of anecdotal observations on my part. Yeah, it's the concerns have definitely bubbled up. Um, uh, you know, to I mean, not to say they're you know sort of all over the place, but we've you know heard, um, or rather, Spark members have come to us, you know, sort of 
uh, surfacing discussions that they've had, you know, sort of with a, a tension on campus around both, you know, sort of the the desire to, you know, sort of use as much you know, academic material as possible to train AI by like faculty involved in that kind of researcher for text and data mining, um, you know, and then folks coming saying, you know, being less com comfortable, uh, you know, with their scholarship, um, their research being ingested by by AI, you know, it's something that we're following really, really closely and looking at how we can best support libraries and navigating that discussion. Um, you know, but I think one of the things that's very top of mind, you know, sort of in these conversations is, uh, you know, folks are continuing to publish with the largest publishers, but not choosing to license uh, openly out of that concern, uh, you know, that it's, it is really offering, or that, that path really only offers illusory protection um, you know, over ingest by AI, you know, given what Will talked about earlier with publishers striking deals with AI companies, um, you know, that path, you know, seems to really just guarantee that it's really just the, the publishers that own the copyright uh, that will be benefiting, um, you know, from uh, you know, an AI licensing deal, not that by not openly licensing your work, it won't be ingested, um, you know. And so, you know, we're also looking at, you know, trying to highlight how, you know, the open licensing of works helps ensure that a broad range of folks can build AI models um, on, you know, the breadth of the research literature rather than that being limited to just entities that can negotiate for access um, to all of this content. Um, but it is a complex, you know, it is a complex issue and we want to be sensitive to faculty's concerns. Um, so, you know, again, we're looking at this really closely and again, how we can best support libraries and navigating, um, you know, that, that tension and talking to, to faculty that um, you have those concerns. There was a question about books being behind serial publications from Elizabeth Zuschiks. I don't know if Elizabeth is still with us. Um, I wasn't sure if the question was about the use of books or just the movement toward openness, if, if the scholarly monograph is still lagging behind the journal article in terms of embracing openness. And if it's the latter, I. Did I mention that it's hard to keep up? I know that there's you know a half dozen efforts to come up with models for open access uh, scholarly monographs. Uh, my old shop at Michigan, I know, is there's this subscribe to open, not subscribe to open, um, eh, the fun to mission. They, they all have something to something. Um, and there's several others. So I know that there's work underway, but it is a culture, the monograph culture changes more slowly. Um, and, and scholars are still coming to learn about what the advantages might be of uh, open monograph publication. Uh, others of you have, and I don't, may, Will, maybe you know, I don't know what's being done in terms of um, licensing for language model training uh, for, for books. Mm -hmm. There's the vast universe of uh, Google Books, whether that's being used as for training models, I suppose it is. Uh, I think if it's open, it's it's being used by by some folks at least. Um, and to the extent that those publisher, the right that this, a similar publisher might make books and serials available, you'll you'll see a similar set of deals set there. I just wanted to underline Robin's point, which is this: it's a whirlwind to keep up with all this stuff, and that's something we've said several times already. But um, you know, this this is the the tip of the tip of the iceberg that we've discussed over the past three weeks. So I, I appreciate the great stuff being shared here and the conversation going on. And I, I know our next session is going to be another good opportunity to share some of those resources. Nick, do we have a way for people to suggest some of those questions the faculty ask? Uh, why yes, uh, in the the survey that will auto populate when we end the event. Uh, so they, the if they register, they uh, have the opportunity. Okay, that's great. Uh, yeah. So in the feedback form for today, uh, you can uh, can provide you know a question if one's top of mind for um, you know uh, you know, basically is there a, a, a question that you know faculty on your campus may ask that you'd uh, like to have more backup in, in answering, um, and we'll feed that into the, the next session on September 30th. 
And I think we had a couple of topics in chat that we'll look to as well, or in, in the Q&A section as well. I think those are the questions that I that I think we can answer here. Are there other questions you want to ask at this point or now 25 minutes after we promised to let you go? Or is your patience wearing thin and you really do need to go to that next session? So um, I'll, I'll quickly say thank you. And Maria, do you want a last word as the sort of uh, captain of this? No, no, it's just, a, it's, been, it's been great doing these. And I learned a lot. I, I always learn things from my collaborators, but uh, just it's, in this context and the kind of give and take in, in the uh, webinars, I've learned a lot and I'll be taking it back into the classroom for sure. Thank you. Thanks so much, y'all. Yeah, thanks everybody. The recording will be available later and we're always happy to chat.